Charles, how you doing? We got Jim Bissell, part two. How you feeling, Charles? I, f- I feel great, Drew. Uh, I just always love the energy you bring here, and uh, I really appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate you, Charles. Um, do we want to tell people where you were last night? Oh, you, you're gonna, you're calling me out now. You want me to? I mean, I guess oh, I, yeah. put, I put it on social media, so it's fine. I, I did. I went to the Super Bowl, and I was rooting on the Rams, and it was amazing. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and that that halftime show was amazing. Oh man. Yeah, it was great. Uh, you didn't tell me where you ate, though. Did you have anything good? And you had In and Out on the way home, so I, w- I was wondering, did you not eat anything at the stadium? I ate some. I ate an, an extremely expensive hot dog in the stadium. It was, in fairness, a giant hot dog. But uh, and I had Randy's donuts on the way to the stadium, which was crucial. I had a special yeah. Rams donut that they made. Yeah, that was pretty great. But the food in the stadium not that great. It. I only had the hot. I couldn't have. I mean, yeah, I, I only tried one thing. So I, you know, the hot dog was okay. It was a hot dog. It was fine. Okay. Okay. You didn't want to lose your spot. You didn't want to miss any any part of the game. Yes. You. Yeah. I didn't need to spend any more money. That's true. So. <laughs> was, is the whole thing climate controlled? That's what I was wondering about. I don't know. It's kind of half outside. It's really a remarkable achievement. This stadium, SoFi Stadium, is really wonderful. Yeah, it looks beautiful. Yeah, it's so. really cool. I looked for you, Charles. I couldn't. I couldn't see it. Oh, you didn't but, see me. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I waved. Oh, okay. good. I thought. I, if, <laughs> no, we are. We're back. Uh, we're you're back. here. Yeah. You're. We're so. We're excited to have you here, and we're. Uh, we're excited to be back with Jim Bissell because this was a. This was a great interview. Yeah. I thought. We've we've been fighting to get this one for a long time, and Jim was so awesome to sit down with us and talk with us. Yeah. Uh, total pro, and uh, if you know anything about him or his career. You're going to be rewarded uh, in this episode because we talk a little bit about other aspects of his career, including E.T. and the Rocketeer, and a little bit more about 1906, which we talked about last yes. time. Mm-hmm. So um, I think this is something for everybody. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that. Yeah. Uh, but we loved talking to him. I, I would welcome him back anytime. Yeah. But before we get into that, I obviously got to give some shout outs, Charles, if I may, unless you have anything else on the agenda. No, go for okay. it. Let's, let's hear it. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Jeremy Dillon and his podcast, My Favorite Album, where every week he talks to a different actor, musician, songwriter, writer, podcaster about the albums they love and how it's influenced them and their work. And you and I have, have gone on recently to talk about our favorite albums and also to talk about the top 10 movies of 2021. So check those out. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to John B., who's been with us for so long, and we really appreciate him, and also Elvis Ripley. So uh, without further ado, let's get into Jim Bissell Part 2, and we'll be back afterwards to wrap things up. You shot the opera house too throughout the entire production too, right? Uh, so opera, you... No, no. We, we, the thing that we did with the opera was we had one week to shoot all the exteriors in the lobby uh, in Vienna. Okay. And then we had uh, this wonderful stage. I can't remember what the name of the stage is, but it's where rock rock groups go to set up their whole outfit and, and sort of vet and and do shakedowns of their touring companies. So okay. they had they had a little bit of the infrastructure, like, you know, when, uh, when she gets under the rope and comes down, so a lot of that stuff was there. And so we, I designed the set around it and then the backstage set around the stuff that looks like backstage stuff. And then and then it goes to the front and then we, we went and did like the first five rows of the house beyond the orchestra pit. But the orchestra pit, the stage and all the sets uh, were, were all built and there. And then you also had the, the box that the, uh, Prime Minister sat in, or the premier uh, premier sat in, and then uh, and then the rest of it was added on as a set extension. So where was where was that the set that you're talking about where the rock groups kind of test things out? Where where was that? Well, it's a stage. It's a stage, and that's where that's where we built the interior of the Vienna uh, Opera. Okay. And, and, but it's really high. It's like sixty six feet to the grid, and it and it has a lot of the stage rigging already in it. Wow. Yeah, so that that's why we were able to capitalize on that. You know that big spiral spiral staircase that she goes yeah. up. You no, know, that that was there. That was already there. Oh wow! And we keyed a lot of that off of the off of the stuff that we had there, and then tried to just make it look like it was in the actual Vienna Philharmonic. I mean, uh, Vienna Opera House is awesome. I mean, they have you can go down 
four stories, but the, 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 all the stages, the stages can collapse down and go to four different levels and load stuff on and then go back up again. It's massive. I mean, wow. it's just unbelievable. And it's, and, and of course the, the lobby is spectacular. It's uh, in this absolutely gorgeous bit of architecture. Did you go to the premiere there? No, I didn't. No, I can't even remember where I was. <laughs> <laughs> there, there were a lot of endings. Um, I think they were, were toying with, and then they kind of ended up. There was, a, I think, they broke for the holidays, and then came back and sort of came up with this smaller ending with the, you know, with the amount of days they had left and everything. Mm -hmm. Do you know what other were there other concepts for the climax that you guys discussed? I've probably forgotten about them by now, but uh, God, and there were so many. I mean, I can remember scouting Ascot for that i can remember scouting i can remember just going around and saying you know once again trying to follow uh follow macquarie's mandate you know and find a place that invites action <laughs> i can remember going to the location manager and saying what's the counterweight room look like inside london tower bridge he goes well oh, let's go find out and we did <laughs> <laughs> and we went with macquarie we went up into into big uh into elizabeth tower which is where big ben is Right. Bill. Was that finale always set to be in London? Uh, it, I, we sort of committed to London after we committed to just going ahead and, and jumping into the uh, jumping into uh, the Vienna uh, Opera House scene. We knew we were going to be in Vienna, and then we figured, all right, then we'll go to Morocco, and then after Morocco, we'll head back to London, and we can't afford to go anywhere else. So that's it. <laughs> so whatever it is that we come up with has got to be in London. <laughs> Uh, can you talk a little bit about Morocco and some of the stuff you did there? Morocco, well, I, yeah, I like Morocco a lot. I mean, Greg Schmurz did a fabulous job on the uh, motorcycle stuff. Yeah, we're trying to get a hold of him. Wasn't there like a, a, a padded wall or something that was built to, for the motorcyclists for when the car hits them? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I mean, I did that in Ghost Protocol with Tom, for Tom, uh, you know, when he straps his belt around and takes the, the leap off the hospital. Yeah. Uh, you know, all of the cobblestone down below him was all foam cast and, and painted to look like uh, cobblestone. And he loved that. He said, I want more <laughs> of that. <laughs> That's great. Well, can we talk? Can we talk about the record store? And like, were there record stores that you loved that you kind of paid homage to in this record store? Or I mean, because obviously there, it has to be a record store, but it, has, it serves such an important plot point, too. Yeah, well, the thing was, it you know, it had to have the booth it had, that he could go, that he gets trapped in. It had uh, that there had to be sort of a, a slight logic to the fact that, you know, he's in London and you get one of the most, you know, that that little those archways that's right off Piccadilly Circus, and it's really beautiful. It's, it's so textured and wonderful. And then, uh, but then you say, uh, you know, he goes into this sort of subterranean record store. So you had the vaulted ceilings and the brick and all that. Of course, it's a set, but it's. Uh, but it sort of matches the uh, the architectural vernacular of the of the richness of the street scene that you've just been in, and you go down and and it looks nice and uh, and but but it also is a segue to later on he's even further under underground in this dungeon, so you feel like you know you are really you know descending down into Hades, right. and that that's sort of the only thing that controlled it. I mean I love the vaulted ceilings and the scenics did a fantastic job on all that brick and. It looked good. I, I thought it was a really nice looking set. So you brought up the dungeon. Yeah. What was the decision process around that kind of pole uh, that he's strapped to? And that was Greg. Because Greg had the idea that he, you know that he <laughs> flips himself upside down and you know uh, uh, gets him up over the pole. And I went, all right, well, I, I, I we can give you a pole. <laughs> you just got to make it look real. And I think he did. I, I think it's still, you know, you still feel like, oh my God, talk about core strength. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We don't have that either. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Wait. And so I think Chris Peck maybe mentioned to us that the record store was originally going to be in Ghost Protocol. Do you remember that? Was there, was it a different approach or? We were going to open the movie in, in the record store and have this, a similar kind of opening, except not having Tom get gassed. But had the you know he he listens and he gets the mission on a uh, on a record and the record destroys itself. Was it the same? Was it the same set you designed for Ghost Protocol? Oh no no because okay. that was that one actually was a location in Vancouver. Oh yeah. Do you remember what the record store was called? We're gonna have to go there now and pay homage. I cannot remember. Okay. But it was it was over. Um, uh, you know what's the neighborhood just south of Kitts Point? I have no, I have no idea, Charles. Do you know? 
No. Yeah. <laughs> More in that area. I think we even had a location agreement and everything. And then, oh, wow. Okay. You know, and uh, it was, uh, I think it's on 4th Street. Okay. Yeah. What else is there from Rogue Nation? Well, there's the scene where Tom Hollander is there and there's the big reveal of Alec Baldwin giving his big speech about Tom Cruise. And all, it's like a consulate or something. But do you remember what that was? Giving a speech about... Oh, you mean it's the Senate subcommittee? No, it's when it, it's when uh, Cruz reveals himself to be there. What is that? What is that character's name? Charles Attlee? Yeah. Oh, Attlee. Oh, oh, you mean the one at Blenheim Castle? There you go. Yes, that's yes. what it was. Yeah, that. Oh, Blenheim Castle, so awesome. You know, Blenheim Castle was built. Uh, they started construction in 1817 on this place. It's probably. Uh, excuse me, not 1817, 1717, 1717 and 1718. And it was built, uh, it's sort of, what was the movie about uh, Mary, uh, uh, The Favorite? Okay. Remember The Favorite? Right, so that yeah. queen, uh, The Favorite was the, uh, was the wife of the Duke of Marlborough, who was the hero of the Battle of Blenheim. And so the Queen Mary said, all right, isn't in, in gratitude for your uh, victory and the glory of England, you know, I'm gonna give you the build to this, uh, build you this fabulous mansion. Well, they're building the mansion, but uh, you know, everybody had their fingers in it. Christopher Wren, all the famous architects of the time took a shot at part bits and pieces of it. It it turned into just a nightmare and a little bit like some movies I've worked on. Uh, you know, where everybody had a bit and piece and they're cutting it together. And But it's still probably one of the finest examples of British uh, Rococo architecture there is. And I just remember, because it's still privately owned. It's still, it's now, that was the first Duke of Marlborough. And it's, I think, two weeks before we were starting to shoot there. And this is how they make their money and keep the castle restored is they, they have tourists. They have, a, you can go to the gift shop, <laughs> you get in the tour bus and you can walk through, you see all the fabulous art and you see this really interesting castle and then you uh and you pay your fee and this is how they pay for the grounds and and keep it going and uh, and the duke of, the current duke of marlborough has his own private quarters and then they you know they shut it down every once in a while for the family to take over the entire place but for the most part it's uh you know it's like many other grand country estates in the uk where they uh you know where they they pay for the upkeep by basically promoting tourism and and filming but that's why the UK has so many great, great locations because you have all these fabulous rent castle locations. Were there any sets that you did build for Rogue Nation? You don't sound particularly sentimental about the sets that don't make it in the movie, but were there any that you remember being so cool and wishing was made the final cut? Not really. You know, I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> the thing is, yeah, I, I always, the thing is, yeah, it's hard work, you know, designing the stuff and supervising it to, to its ultimate end is is tough work, but it only makes sense when you're really working on it, when it is, associates itself with the narrative. When it no longer is relevant to the narrative, it's like okay, that's gone. Let's now. What do I focus on? Right, right. You know, it's uh, it it it's just like okay, I see, I know why it's gone, and it's dead to me now. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, I get a pang. I'll remember a set, and I'll go, "Oh, that was cool. Maybe we should build a movie around that or something." <laughs> but uh, you uh, you brought up the the Senate subcommittee, and it reminded me that uh, that's a, a an amazing visual reference to uh, Alan Pakula's uh, the Parallax View. Yeah. Where where did those conversations start to make that reference? Well, Chris Chris is an extraordinary student of film. Macquarie is. And and so, you know, a lot of the time, you know, whenever he didn't tell me, you know, just go find me a place that invites action, then a lot of the visual stuff is is film reference. And he did reference Parallax View, and I, and I agreed with him totally. I, I, I love, I think Bob did a wonderful job lighting it. Yeah. I think it looks cool. It looks really great. And yeah. that's, a, that's really an inexpensive set. It's, you know, it's a really cool elevated desk uh, up against, you know, a fairly plain background and a big, and a big seal. Right. And you just light what you're going to see and don't light anything else. And it looks great. And there were also, there was a visual reference to Three Days of the Condor when Ethan calls in and there's a kind of an IMF call center. Is that another conversation that just came from, from Macquarie? Pretty much, yeah. yeah it's, it's, I'd say but between, it's usually from Macquarie because he, he really is an extraordinary student of film. And the, uh, uh, but so is so is El Ellswit, and I'm I'm not that bad either. And uh, <laughs> so, somewhere in there, you know, when we when we really have to scramble and pull something up quick, 
Well, are there other other ones that maybe we haven't? I mean, th those are the two that that uh, I think people you know comment on sometimes online. They bring it up, but are there other ones that maybe we've missed that you n remember? Some other film references in this in the production design? Well, uh, you know, most of the time I, I I do my own revisionism, and I and I try to credit myself as being completely original on everything I do. So <laughs> we agree. <laughs> <laughs> Um, since we have you, since you're our captive audience, we have to pepper you with questions about your other aspects of your career. Yes. So I hope you're in the mood to be flattered. Um, and oh, okay. Some yeah. Always. <laughs> okay. Charles, do you want to start off with some, some questions? Well, I guess, I mean, the, the big one we should ask about is E.T. I yes. mean, you, you were the production designer for E.T. And I mean, when I think of that movie, I always think of all the crazy hazmat stuff at the end and all like those big tubes and things. And. Where did that stuff come from? I guess is my first question about ET. <laughs> uh, it's a good story. It's a good question and a really great story. I love the story. Originally, uh, the original script by Melissa Matheson had ET e e and Elliot taken to a hospital, and they're they're in a like an ICU at a hospital, and the the guys, the the neighborhood kids, go to the hospital and spring Elliot and ET from the hospital. They escape out through the hospital and they go back to the landing site and take ET to the landing site. You know, after the uh, communicator gets activated, and Stephen, I think, had gone to England and uh, for some sort of royal premiere. It might have been Raiders of the Lost Ark. I can't quite remember, but uh, he was flying back in at the time. The Bradley International Terminal was built in '86 for the uh, for the LA Olympics, and so this was '82 or '81. I can't even remember which one. And the uh, there was a temporary international terminal, and it was in a big pneumatic building. You know, it was one of those big sort of you you fill it full of air and it looks like a giant pillow. <laughs> so he had landed and he's going through that and, and he says, and he has the idea, let's not do it in the hospital, let's bring it home. Let's cover the house in this big pneumatic thing. So he calls me from the airport. I, I think Kathy called me from the airport, meet Stephen over at MGM. And so I, I go over and he's all excited and he's saying, we'll, we'll make this, you know, we'll do it at home. And I'm thinking, yeah, this, the conversion of taking that, uh, that living room, playroom area and turning it into a hospital, that could be really a lot of fun. Now, what had happened was I had been playing with, uh, just for the hospital stuff, I had been working with this company down in, uh, in Orange County called Field Tech. And they they put together these mobile sterile units with uh, with the uh, high efficiency particulate air uh, filter systems. They use them for both medical uh, temporary medical uh, uh, facilities as well as for places where you really need clean air, high tech areas like battlefield uh, supercomputers and things like that. This is back in the eighties. Remember that this is forty years ago. So I had been working with them, and one of the things that they used to create sealed environments was this uh, 30 mil PVC that's, and uh, I was having a great time playing with it. And so we started first of all, by, by going to some, uh, some of these companies that do these big pneumatic structures and seeing what it would take to put one of these inflatable uh, things ov over the house that we had, the location house. We couldn't change the location because this was like six weeks before we we're gonna start shooting. And we did not, uh, all, all the interior sets were built at Culver City. They matched this exterior location and we just didn't want to you know, mess with that too much. But to make a level foundation so that you could actually create this pneumatic house, it would have just been like cost prohibitive and we couldn't have gotten it done in time. So I started thinking, okay, well, then you can always do what fumigators do, which is just you know cover it in plastic tent. But then I thought, well, it'll look like they're fumigating the house. That's not particularly dramatic. But then I got remembered this PVC, this uh, matte finish PVC, and started thinking about the artist Christo's work, you know, and the way that he used sheets and things to cover and trans, uh, transform various uh, volumes into other otherworldly kind of looking things. And uh, I just really love his work. So uh, Ed Vero, it, it, it was a very small art department. It was me, Jim T. Garden, Ed Vero. Ed was doing storyboards. Jim was doing set design, uh, the, the working drawings. And I was the art director, production designer. So uh, Ed, Ed and I sat down, we started sketching away and Ed did this wonderful little Prismacolor sketch. And I went and pitched it to, to Steven and said, I don't think we can do the pneumatic structure, but we could do this. 
And if we pull it and tweak it a little bit and we do lights coming out of the windows, I mean, we're talking expressionism here. We're, we're going to have uh, we're going to have something that sort of looks like it came straight out of Dr. Caligari's cabinet. And uh, he got excited about it. And so that was the way we went. And I remember the, the day that we went there. It was the day before we were going to shoot it. And we had this big piece of, uh, of heat, heat seamed 30 mil PVC, 120 feet by 90 feet, a big piece of plastic. And we, uh, we had contracted with this boom, this 120 foot boom arm crane to come in. And the guy that showed up to put this, to raise this thing up and drape it over the house, the crane operator was drunk. And as he started, as he started to back up and uh, and 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 put the get the crane close so that he could do it, he started cracking the uh, driveway. The, tr the truck was too heavy, so we pull the truck off, fire the guy, get rid of him, and our construction coordinator just gets in his pickup truck. Ernie Depew gets in his pickup truck. He's driving up and down Sunland Boulevard, and he sees a boo a little light sign boom arm crane that's you know works on billboards and he hails the guy off you know flashes his lights pulls him over and says come on up here here's some cash we need you and the guy comes up and we had this long piece of uh 90 foot unit uh, aluminum unistrut that had like two pick points on it so we put this piece of plastic on it he starts to lift it up lift it up and the and the aluminum goes me falls in half oops we put two more pick points on it and lift it up, bends again. It's like 4.30 in the afternoon. I'm going, my career's over. And we put <laughs> seven pick points on it. And slowly but surely, as the sun is setting, this thing lifts up. And as it gets to the top, it's like almost 100 feet in the air because it's a 120-foot boom arm. And this breeze comes down from the San Gabriel Mountains, filling this thing up full of air and I'm going, oh my God, it's gonna fly away like a kite. And it doesn't. And I'm on top of a cherry picker with a bullhorn and slowly but surely he's lowering this thing on the house and I'm getting him to pull it over to the sides so that we get this really beautiful draping. And just as the sun goes down, we finish the job. <laughs> and it was like, <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> wow. It was amazing. And it looks spectacular. We shot it the yeah. next night and it was, you know, and, uh, and Alan Davio shot that and, and Alan was, you know, what a fabulous cinematographer he, he was, God rest his soul. Yeah. A shame nobody saw the movie though. Uh, it is. I think, <laughs> I think it'll, it'll find its audience one it'll, day. Well, uh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Whole new generation uh, coming up now. Before we go, I have to ask you, I told you before, big fan of Joe's. Love the Rocketeer. What a fucking gorgeous movie that is. Yeah. And your sets are fucking amazing. Do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite memory from Rocketeer just before we go? I've got tons. Are you kidding me? I mean, I the, my, one of my favorite things is we all loved the uh, Bulldog Cafe. The design, yes. it, it was so great. And so the, uh, three days before we were going to shoot it, the whole art department dressed in period clothing drove out to the Santa Clarita Valley, which, which is where it was. And we had we had cocktails and we and we dined in the Bulldog Cafe. Ah. <laughs> it was so much fun and had a great time. Um, but the South Seas Club was fantastic. And the interior of uh, what's his name? Uh, Neville Sinclair's house. Yeah, it was based on uh, based on the uh, um, Ennis Brown house in uh, the Hollywood Hills. I was going to ask which which right house that was. It was the Ennis Brown, and, and we you know it doesn't it doesn't look like any of the floor plan, but we did uh, purchase from the estate the rights to use the the patterned brick. Oh, so that's an actual. That's the actual right pattern. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I have to ask you this because I. I Asked everybody else, do you remember the animated sequence? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did you have any input uh, into that? Not a whole lot. Uh, Joe worked directly with uh, the Disney animators to get yeah. that. And uh, I mean, you know, we, we talked about the big beats only because that's another great set, though, the interior of Howard Hughes' office, which oh, was built inside oh. the, the hangar down in Long Beach. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Did Disney own that hangar at the time? I don't know. I don't think they did. Because at one point, that when... Uh, maybe it was now, this is not the big dome. This is not. Oh, the big okay. Dome. This was this was the actual seaplane hangar. Okay. That was down, and it was torn down shortly after we finished using it. it uh, this was in uh, wow. 92, 91. 90, 90. We worked on the movie in ninety. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Did it did it disappoint you that 
I mean, that one out did not find its audience, at least initially. Did that disappoint you? Yeah. 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 No, I, 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 I still think it's, you know, I look at what Joe did on Captain America and it's, you know, it's, it's Rocketeer on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, and I think he did a brilliant job. And I, cause he, you know, Joe's a good director. He's really, really a great director. I think he reju rejuvenated the Jurassic, uh, Jurassic Park franchise with this. Oh, I'm a big, I'm a big Jurassic Park three fan. It's really good. Yeah. It's, it's really yeah. good. I actually, I, I really am. I love that movie. <laughs> I think it's the best sequel. It's so great. It really is. Yeah. Well, I know we're running out of time. We have, we have some questions that we ask every guest mm -hmm. on the show. And have have you watched all the Mission Impossible movies at this point? I no, I haven't seen I haven't seen the last one. I haven't seen Freefall. Oh, man. Okay. Well, do you? I guess you said you, you, uh, Rogue Nation. I mean, sorry, Ghost Protocol is your favorite. Do you have another favorite? Maybe after that one or top three? No, not really. As a matter of fact, you know, I'd have to confess I'm not a big fan of the first, uh, the first two. You know, uh, I, I like Brian De Palma's work, but I, I just. I wasn't that engaged in the first one. The second one is awful. <laughs> and the third one, the third one, the J.J. Abrams one, I liked it a lot, but it's very dark, you know, and it's and it's brutal. And uh, and that's what I love so much about Go when when Brad came in. Uh, he, he captured a lightness. It's not really a lightness. It's just it's it's he he finds a place to find a little bit of existential grace. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. As opposed to it being so relentlessly dark and, you know, important. You know, I say that I'd have the same problem with, say, Dune right now. You know, if you ever don't, if you ever really want to sort of escape Dune a little bit and not take it too seriously, Hans Zimmer's score will not let you. <laughs> <laughs> and I find that, that that was sort of true in a way with the, the, you know that's some, sometimes I don't like that when you when you just take it way too seriously. Yeah, and I, I thought uh, I thought Brad's deft touch was really what was needed. Yeah, do you have a favorite Tom Cruise haircut in these movies <laughs> from the Mission movies? I don't. I don't. I don't really. You kind of you got sort of extreme ends of the spectrum. You had him so he was so hairy and beautiful in Ghost Protocol, and then he had a little bit shorter crop cut in Rogue Nation. Yeah, but he had the beard in the beginning when he went when he went uh, you know when he went yeah, on cover. He's got that. Yeah, That's very right. convincing. Just beard. a good vari variation there, you know. <laughs> when he went to Paris, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. It had to be a you know. It had to be. Uh, uh, it was a fairly quick set that we threw together, and but I loved it. It was like you know you know France Galop. <laughs> you know, it had all the beams and everything else, and you look out the window and there's the Eiffel Tower. It's like, okay, let's. Is there any other cliche we can throw in here? <laughs> <laughs> People need to know where it's set. You know. Well, you've got you've got the Lost City coming out in a couple of months. Do you have anything else you want to plug that we should be promoting? Ah, uh, well, Lost. I, I I love the trailer on Lost City. I am, and I'm we're working with the same directors on um, on Masters of the Universe. Okay. And uh, I really like working with them. They're great guys. Uh, really, really interesting. Very. They they have that same kind of death touch. They're they're they don't take themselves too seriously, but at the same time, they're very focused and and really want to create interesting textured stories that uh, is stuff I really enjoy working on. What What's the over under on 1906 ever seeing the light of day? I really don't know, honestly. I think I, you know, God knows I'd love to do it. I I built a whole model based off the in, the uh, insurance plans, you know, the, uh, the, the fire insurance maps that they made, that the insurance companies make. I had the footprint for everything. And, and San Francisco was so well documented photographically that you just have to, extract the volumes and put in the, the the approximates and then you could project the textures from the black and white photographs on it and i had i had the whole of pre-1906 san francisco built in uh in my computer on in maya and you know and, and we could location scout with it wow <laughs> listen jim if those if those uh documents were ever to be sent via email uh we have a there's a couple of people i think that would love to <laughs> take a look um <laughs> You wouldn't know how to open them. I don't think any of the software is still in existence. Oh. <laughs> You'd be surprised how in, uh, enterprising we can be. Um, but uh, yeah, we just want to thank you so much. Um, yes. If you ever want to come back, let us know. And yeah, and I know we didn't have time, but before you go, I just want to say how much I love your work on Jumanji as well. Just some of those those sets that are inside the house and also in the jungle. I mean, it's just, uh, just such... Um, 
those images are just uh, you know uh, seared into my brain. They're just amazing. There's a Jumanji. In oh, the... we're seeing the posters now in your room. That's yeah. all the posters I've got up. That's those are the only ones. I got. Do you have Do you have the little ILM uh, Rocketeer helmet that Joe has? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's in that little. Uh, it's in that right over there. Oh. I love it. What is it? What what is the what is the toy? Is it a toy? Or it's not it? a toy. It's like a little pa like lead paperweight. Well, oh, now it's oh, oh. <laughs> that's awesome. He's going to get it now. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Joe did the same thing with me. He said, "Hold on, let me go run and grab it." <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. I may not be able to get this damn thing open. Don't worry about it. I've I've, okay. I've seen it. Joe's already <laughs> showing you his that I'm not going to show you mine. Yeah, don't yeah, <laughs> don't, don't make it a compare and contrast, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> his is probably bigger than mine. Well, thank you so much. If you ever want to come back and chat, we are more than welcoming you back anytime you want. Have something to plug or anything, let us know. Well, thanks guys. It's good to yeah. talk to you. back charles what a ride what a ride he was great it was a it was just yeah what a wonderful time to talk with him and it, it lived up yeah there's so many good little good little uh things to to bring up i mean the the record store they were going to shoot in ghost protocol which we found out about recently and it was an actual record store in vancouver i'm curious if anyone out there knows which store he's talking about he kind of started talking about specifics of what area it was in and, and i'm curious if anybody's been there and if they have please let us know what it is and send pictures how closely does it fit this record store that's in the movie we want to know is there a booth where someone could possibly be poisoned <laughs> well it sounds like that wasn't going to happen in ghost protocol that was only a rogue nation development right 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 so they were going to shoot it on location in Ghost Protocol, and then they built a set for Rogue Nation. Yeah. Okay. But I guess he would have had to get the message in some kind of booth, because he'd have to do it somewhere privately. Yeah. So I assume it had to have booths. Yeah. We should recreate it somehow. <laughs> we should do like a, like an immersive exhibit of all things Mission Impossible, recreate that booth. Oh, my God. We talked about that years ago, that we... Much earlier on this show, we talked about how it would be amazing. You know, they had that Kubrick exhibit in L.A. where yeah. you could go into the room from the end of 2001, A Space Odyssey, and how they should recreate Langley and let you hang in there for a minute and get a, get a photo. Uh, money on the table, <laughs> leaving money on the table. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, we talked about uh, the visual references uh, in Rogue Nation to the Parallax View in Three Days of the Condor. We will post photos of those in our uh, show notes and on social media, so you can check those out. And, and if you haven't seen those movies, you need to stop what you're doing and pause this right now. Go get those movies. Go watch them both. Parallax View, yeah. Three Days of the Condor, both incredible thrillers from the 70s, kind of paranoid thrillers that are just uh, really amazing movies that uh, are among my favorites. And so... Anyway, we'll post those uh, visual references and um, what else? The uh, oh, the ET story. God, it's so great. How how awesome yeah. was that story? I've never I'd never heard anything about that before. Had you? No, me neither. No, and I I forgot to mention when he was on the show that he also created the uh, opening titles for the Amazing Stories show, the Spielberg oh, show yeah. in the eighties. One of the most like amazing opening title sequences too. So e even though we talk about ET, we talk about the Rocketeer on this episode. Jim Bissell's career is so amazing. I, I, you know, encourage everybody to look up his filmography, see the movies that they haven't seen that he's worked on. I yeah. mean, he is just an unbelievable talent. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, and I love that we got uh, a little more about 1906 as well. We need that script. 187 <sighs> pages. Bah. Greenlight it, please. Apple or Netflix or have Bird do it as a miniseries. We need that. I, I, I get the sensation that Disney has come to him and said, you can do it as a Disney Plus show. And he says, it's a theatrical experience. Oh, you think so? <laughs> I think that has, has happened at least once come in the past Come on, Brad. Couple of years. We'll wear him down. I know. We'll wear him I down. Know. We'll wear him down. But um, <laughs> yeah, what else? do you, you have some shout outs to give too, don't you? Uh, I do. I do have a shout out. Yeah, I, I got to give uh, a special thank you to uh, Jacob Ballard and to Ben Wright. Uh, thank you to Jacob and, and Ben who have been with us for a long time uh, for making this episode possible. And also want to credit our composer, Kevin Blumenfeld, and our editor and mixer, Luke Burson. 
And I want to encourage everybody to sign up for the Patreon, patreon.com slash light the fuse. We do bonus episodes every week. Anytime there's news about mission, you can count on a bonus episode right away where we, we digest whether it's the release date delays or casting updates or whatever, something happened in the news related to mission, then you can count on us talking your ear off all about it. So uh, sign up for the Patreon. Uh, and uh, there's a, lots of other, a lot of other good stuff we do on there too. We, we analyze other movies, movies we love. We, 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 we talk about, we did recently, we did a, uh, it was a popular episode we did was uh, all about, we ranked all of John McTiernan's movies, you know, so we talked about all his, all of his films beyond just Die Hard and Predator and Hunt for October. We, we ranked them all because uh, we are obviously big fans of his. That was a good episode. Uh, we do stuff like that all the time. Um, and so you should sign up. And also I wanted to tell everybody to go to our Tee Public store, which is linked from our website, lightthefusepodcast.com. If you go to the merch tab on our website, you'll find a link to the Tee Public store. And uh, while you're on the website, you can also check out our episode guide and look at uh, the show notes for every episode. We do a lot of great show notes for uh, every episode, and some of them are more extensive than others. Uh, and there's always a lot of good behind-the-scenes goodies in there that you should definitely check out. And also, I want to remind everybody again to, uh, to go get that MI3 vinyl from uh, Mondo. It's really amazing uh, the, the, what, they, what they're putting together at Mondo of all the Mission Impossible soundtracks is amazing. Mo and everybody there at Mondo doing awesome work. And uh, we have a giveaway we have to do. We have, uh, we have a couple of uh, copies of that. We're going to figure out how to do that. Yeah. Bonus points if you can go to the store in Vancouver and go into that booth and listen to this vinyl. <laughs> that is the ultimate scenario. Yes. Right? Go, go, go in that store, take pictures of yourself, and then maybe we'll give you one of these... Uh, these yeah. free uh, uh, MI3 vinyl soundtracks. Um, and then, um, yeah, what else? Oh, I, I just want to, again, I know I've said this already about, uh, uh, last week, but I'll say it again. I'll remind everybody that if, if you have not seen my movie Night Owls, check it out on, on HBO Max or on demand on DirecTV or Spectrum. And it's also still on, I think, Canopy, which is free with a library card, and I think Tubi and uh, Pluto maybe. I don't, it's, on, it's on a bunch of streaming services. So anyway, if you haven't seen Night Owls, I encourage you to check it out. It was... Uh, very personal project to me and I put my life and everything into it. So it was, it was, uh, 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 something I'm really proud of. So check it out. If you, if you have any interest in, in that, uh, kind of, um, dark comedy, romantic comedy, sort of, uh, vibe indie movie. You getting some, uh, residuals that goes on HBO Max? Uh, I, we, I do. I, I've, uh, I, I did not much, <laughs> okay. but hopefully from this new deal, there will be more. Uh, okay, yeah, for sure. Good. Uh, after you watch Charles's movie, be sure to follow us on social media as oh, well. I yes. can't stress that enough, too. you got to go check us out on Twitter and Instagram. And we are going to be hopefully expanding to other social media platforms in the months ahead. Um, so look out for that. Obviously, the the first place we, we drop any news is on our social channels. So be sure to keep an eye out for that. And, yeah, I think that's it. And we'll be back next week. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.